So Gary Edelman really doesn't need an introduction anywhere in the Civil War world, but I'm going to give him one anyway. So he is the chief historian of the American Battlefield Trust, the largest preservation group of its type in the whole world related to the American Civil War. He's been a licensed battlefield guide for 25 years at the Gettysburg National Military Park and just received his guide emeritus, special status. Uh, for the old timers, uh, we hate to say that, but it's true. <laughs> and he is the author, co-editor, editor, co-author co of 20 books and more than 30, 50 articles, I guess, Gary, somewhere around 50 articles. So he's very prolific in all these things. And he's just a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful speaker as well. So without any further ado, he's going to talk about Civil War myths and mistakes. Please welcome Gary. All right, all right. Thank you so much, Wayne, and, and for all y'all. I, I, you know, don't. I, I come to about one twentieth the invitations I get. I'm not saying that to be cocky or anything. I work at the trust, so I get a lot of invitations. Um, and I come here for a bunch of reasons, but mostly because I have a really good experience every time I come. Besides which, you know, Wayne is always very generous to me in my uh, in my introduction. So um, here's a three hour talk in forty five minutes. Uh, we have lots to cover, and I'm going to piss. I'm going to anger some of you. There's just no way around it. I'm, I mean, I'm trying to bust myths here, but really, what you're going to do is listen to me talk about the things that drive me nuts as a Civil War person. And let's just get started right away. You know, the first myth I'd like to go into is that somehow we're different from people in the Civil War. Oh, God, you know what? They, they, did, they did things differently, and our lives are substantially different. I disagree with that. I'll get into that more. Um, you know, myth number two, and I'm going to lose count here, of course, is that the Civil War is fought. Tim Smith's favorite here by little boys. Here's some Confederate-clad boys, maybe about, you know, six and ten facing off against some Union cavalry for a post shot. But you see they have some reinforcements there as well, uh, you know, that can come in and join. We know how all the soldiers are. We have pictures of the regiments north and south. We have muster records. We know that there aren't 12, 13, and 14-year-old boys, or even that most of the people in a unit are 16 or 17. Civil War soldiers are 20 and 21 and 22. Um, you know, and you know, you know, but it makes for good pictures to have these guys around. Here they are kneeling at uh, Second Manassas, First Manassas, over some graves over there. And of course, every good unit though does need a band of tiny little musicians hanging out with them. Uh, you know, that you could maybe bring into battle if you need to. Um, of course, God, let's just get this one out of the way. He did not command the Union Army. Uh, this is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Uh, he is not Grant's boss or Meade's boss, nor is he the most important colonel at Gettysburg, nor did he hold the left flank of any army for more than a half, 45 minutes during the Battle of Gettysburg. But because this is a sort of a myth thing, like, oh my God, I'm talking about Chamberlain in a realistic light. He did something really important, but without saying it's the most important thing in the world, people get offended by it. Um, James Longstreet, oh yeah, we know him. He's good on the defense. That's all he's good for. He's a bulldog on the defense because maybe he said it once at Fredericksburg or because he didn't want to make certain attacks at Gettysburg. Well, I would say, you know, at the Battle of Second Manassas, he leads just about the second or third largest attack of the Civil War, and it succeeds. At the Battle of the Wilderness, he leads the third or fourth largest attack of the Civil War, um, and it succeeds as well. Longstreet is an offensive hammer. At Chickamauga, he leads probably the fifth largest attack of the Civil War, all of which are larger than Pickett's Charge, and most of many of which are larger than the Grand Assault at Franklin. Um, so I think sometimes myth just goes, excuse me, to people. Um, where, you know, we have our myths that I'll go through and whatnot, all the people in the regiments are little boys, but really, it really tends to reinforce that people are painted with a broad brush, like this guy, George McClellan. Oh my God, he's scared of everything, and you know what, he was an idiot, and Lincoln was pretty stupid for keeping him in command for a while. Of course that's not the case. He was a great administrator. His troops loved him, okay? He took one of the largest armies to ever exist on the earth, and he took them into Virginia on boats and advanced up the peninsula. You know, he's not perfect. I'm no McClellan fan, to be sure, but the idea that because he, you know, uh, he wasn't aggress as aggressive as you'd like, does not make the guy stupid or something. Um, Ambrose Burnside, this guy really suffers bad. I mean, he's a cool looking dude. Look at him on the left. He, he, he puts on this hat and then he's a joke all of a sudden. Um, you can't get anywhere without his pontoon bridges. You know, here he is sitting with Matthew Brady on a sack of boats at Cold Harbor. Yeah, he fought at Cold Harbor. And, uh, you know, pretty brave too, especially given the current crisis to have a big pile of horse crap right in front of you there. What might happen? Uh, Robert E. Lee, oh my God, everybody. Okay, so this guy didn't always win. Okay? Lee is probably the most important Confederate thing. 
Okay, uh, I don't think there's anything more important you could point to. The Congress, the whole army, Jefferson Davis, I think Lee's probably the most important thing, but that's not enough. We have to blow him up even more to where he was just perfect, and somehow he never called the, en you know, the enemy the enemy, which he totally did, by the way. Just look through the official records. He says those people sometimes, and he talks about the enemy all the time, so I think he has suffered from substantial myth-making as well. Um, one thing that is true about him is he had little tiny baby feet, and he wore white <laughs> socks with black shoes. <laughs> you know, so say that about him. I mean, if you ever sit in that chair at that same spot on those same bricks, you make got to make sure you hike your pants up. And by the way, he made Lee stand up next to you. He had white socks on that day as well. Uh, he works at Gettysburg, if you don't know Frank. Um, George Gordon Meade, yeah, he didn't get fired after Gettysburg, right? He is the commander of the Army of the Potomac for the whole rest of the Civil War. And the idea that somehow he has some lackluster chasing of the Confederate Army after Gettysburg, you know, because he didn't bag the whole Confederate Army, this drives battlefield guides like us crazy because, oh yeah, U.S. Grant, oh, Grant beat Lee. Yeah, every day for 10 months they fought, every day for Grant to wear out and get to surrender an enemy that was one-fifth his size and starving, okay? So keep George Gordon Meade around, in mind. Stonewall Jackson, okay? Again, always won, no, he did not. Even his name, Stonewall, probably doesn't mean what you think it means, it probably fits anyway, but there stands Jackson like a stone wall, they said about him. This was not Jackson standing firm um, and being like there, it meant, um, uh, it, it didn't mean that he was, he was standing there and we're supposed to go and uh, rally behind him. Rather, it was Jackson standing there, let's go to his defense. Uh, we have three accounts of Jackson being named on that day during the battle. They all come from Alabamians, from the same unit, and it was hours after the Union was ready to pour onto Henry Hill. So even his name is somewhat of a misnomer. The guy, you know, ask some of his uh, troops in West Virginia or on the peninsula how they think he did. And by the way, you know, I see him bareheaded here, but I guess he always has a forage cap on. Oh my God. And because he has a forage cap on, everyone with a forage cap is Stonewall Jackson. Look at Stonewall Jackson's gained some weight there. You've got a Union officer who's apparently Stonewall Jackson talking to McClellan. Um, you know, and then because somebody in a picture once is wearing a forage cap and he, oh my God, he has a beard too. It must be Jackson. This is an internet sensation. I found Stonewall Jackson. Well, how many other Confederate camp scenes are there? Um, taken after Charleston in 1861. Show me how many, oh, look how many, these are great Confederate camp scenes. It's none. So why do we think suddenly there's a picture of Stonewall Jackson in camp, okay? Because, you know, Stonewall Jackson's down on the, um, at Charleston Harbor as well. Uh, people weren't like us during the Civil War. They never smiled. They were so stoic. And you know why they did that? Because photo exposures were 75 seconds long, and you couldn't possibly smile. That's totally untrue. And when you just zoom into photographs, and we got lots of photographic myths we can go into, you'll see people, again, they're just like us. They smiled. They found things amusing. Oh, my God, they're human. Um, so this was a guy outside of Petersburg. Here is um, a girl of all places at the Miller Farm in Antietam. Okay? And whether this is a few days after or two weeks after the Battle of Antietam, you know, their house was trashed, their crops are gone, there are dead bodies everywhere, their well is probably poisoned, and for some reason, she's smiling, you know, maybe because she's 14 or so, and she's just giggling and uncomfortable, and I mean, her sister's got head lice or something like that, too, I mean, there's not a lot to be happy about, you know, girls didn't shave their heads or crop them close, as a matter of course, then, here's a guy on the North Anna River on a pontoon bridge, um, here's a guy who has a reason to smile, this is April 3rd, 1865, he's standing on the Confederate parapet, yes, the war is coming to an end, we took Petersburg, I don't blame him for smiling at all, and I always like to include my favorite smirk of the Civil War, and that is Kate Chase who I've always liked. This is Sam and Chase's daughter. She was going to be first lady of the United States when uh, Chase became president, which he was certain he would. Um, but as far as this smiling thing goes, uh, there are these things called Anthony's instantaneous views that can take a picture in a 40th of a second. Okay, so let's keep this in mind. First of all, there's a myth that these were 15 second exposures, when in fact we know that they were more like two seconds or maybe seven or eight seconds if it was really dark out. One fortieth of a second, here is stop action on Broadway um, in New York during Lincoln's funeral, okay? Could you get that if this was a three second exposure? Look how clear all this stuff is, okay? So you could take fast pictures back then. Now, another thing we do to people all the time during the Civil War, North and South, is we see how they fought, and we say, oh my God, they were so much braver than people today. Our soldiers couldn't possibly do this, which from what I can tell is a total load of garbage. Um, I, think, I don't think that they are any braver than our soldiers are today. 
But yet we stand in awe of them for what they did. Here is the, rail, uh, the stockade Redan at Vicksburg. But, you know, you could look at Fort Wagner or Missionary Ridge and wonder how they can muster the courage. So we stand in awe of them. And then we turn around in the next breath and say, um, uh, let me go back to that one. Uh, and then we say, wow, but they went into battle in these long lines of battle, shoulder to shoulder. You know what? They were really stupid. Okay, I wouldn't have fought that way because I'm much smarter than people of the past. Look, they just marched in shoulder to shoulder. Didn't they learn in the Revolution or the War of 1812 that this is somehow isn't going to work? Yes, they did study the previous wars. In fact, you're always a war behind. And if you notice in our current struggles, we're still talking about Desert Storm and Iraqi freedom because you're always a war behind. They only get to practice during wartime. And the Civil War failed to produce some magical way to get at the enemy's entrenchments without marching up with as many people as possible to deliver a concentrated fire at your enemy. You might lose 20%, but you still got 80% left, okay? People often tell me, well, I would take 400 off on one side and then send 200 over here and 50 over here and then 400 in the middle. All your enemy does is shoot the first 400 and reload and shoot the next 250 and reload and shoot the next 50 and reload and then shoot the next 400. But by bringing up everybody at once, you have some chance of harming your enemy, which is why, by the way, you really should have three times the attacking force as the defenders. Going back to this here, um, you also have this idea that civilians are pretty clueless too. Oh my God, they're going to go out and see the battle, and they're going to go out with picnic baskets. Where do they do that? At the Battle of Bull Run or the Battle of First Manassas. And they give the impression like this. They're right on the battlefield. They're deploying into line when really the closest civilians were four miles from the battlefield. Maybe they heard the battle. They saw some smoke rising. But this idea that they are simply on the battlefield, there are southern civilians watching as well, behind the southern line as well. And they are miles away in every case. Okay? And that doesn't mean some people didn't get caught up in the retreat. Oh, man. Okay, so obviously, because General Hood did some things we disagree with, he must have been unlawed. Now, God, the guy's crazy. Plus, he's in pain, he's got a useless arm, he's missing a leg, so he must have been unlawed him all the time. Other than that, we don't have any evidence for this at all. Okay, there's something like one account saying he took it once in a hospital, and we don't have any, but when we want to look at our historical figures, we're looking for explanations, right? So we're kind of going to attach something that we don't know to be true and say, well, that makes more sense. Even if we don't have evidence, let's put General Hood on water. That's the only way you could explain the Battle of Franklin or the missed opportunity at the Battle of Spring Hill. And this guy, drunk, butcher, anti-Semite, okay, clueless, without strategy, just used his numbers as he went along. Okay, well, you know what, he had a real lot of success. Is it just numbers? And, you know, and we'll talk about him later in life a little bit, but, you know, and while he's drinking and doing all these things, by the way, standing on Lookout Mountain, which his, capture, his soldiers captured, you talk about gazing at a height and wonder how the you could capture it. Well, go up there and you'll be able to see how they were able to do so. But this, of course, supposedly has General Grant there. It kind of looks like him. Um, and members of his staff, and when you look at close, closely at these soldiers, they don't look anything like his staff. So it's pretty interesting. Right on top of Lookout Mountain. Um, and of course, you see him smoking his uh, cigar right there, or is he? I would suggest that this is the only cigar photo of U.S. Grant during the entire Civil War. You can see him at Massaponex Church, three stars on his shoulders, uh, the only lieutenant general there, and he's smoking a cigar. But because he has a rumor of being a good cigar guy, and he liked a cigar, obviously, um, every reenactor and every drawing, you have Grant smoking cigars, okay? Um, and here he is at Cold Harbor, no cigar, but no doubt he's thinking about one, and he's thinking about drinking, and he's thinking about what he can do to the Jews, and he's thinking about butchering his own army. Look at him. Um, and this, this is what we do to people, right? We can't help it, right? I mean, we, we don't know these people. So we, we tend to try to gravitate toward, okay, what kind of person was this? And I, you know, you can't read a biography about all these people. Some of you in this room probably have. But how well can you get to know somebody? And how are we going to paint that broad brush on them? It does them a dis disservice, um, but there's no way around it. We're going to do this to some extent. I'm just hoping I'm trying to bust some of the myths for now. In any case, when I look at a better version of Grant on Lookout Mountain, uh, again, there he is in the lower left over there, uh, you know, I'm not seeing a cigar. I'm seeing some sort of a something that's going almost into his nose, okay? And it looks a lot, you know, like, like that, okay? I don't think that works, okay? So when I look closely at it, what I'm seeing is some sort of a stick that is messed with with the emulsion over there. So I think it's Grant. I don't think he's smoking. Uh, but recently I saw another photo of the same spot, and this stick doesn't seem to be there. So now i got to even deal with that or admit I was wrong. Um, so uh, famous shot, and this is also on top of a famous rock called Roper's Rock. 
Um, and this is it from the other side. In fact, that little stump there is where Grant is standing next to it. But look at this rock. Uh, some of you have probably been there before. There's a big plaque at the bottom of it. It's called Roper's Rock because a guy named Roper, a soldier, fell off of it. What most people don't know is that by the time he fell off of it, he was no longer a soldier. Rather, he was a photographer. And he was up there placing people um, up there. And he's the one telling them probably, little back, little back. And he fell off to his death. Look at this. Okay, they, this is a Frank Leslie's illustrated uh, drawing, and it's very graphic, I mean, in the literal last second of his life um, before he died. I believe he's a Pennsylvania soldier. They get his name wrong in the thing, but this is the story. Fascinating story indeed, and uh, we'll get back to some of this too. Um, there are no photos of Civil War battles, right? We know this because because there's 40 second exposures, and how could you possibly be there, or anything like that. Um, and this photo here was supposedly taken on December 15th, uh, 1864, at the Battle of Nashville. This is taken from the Capitol. I can line this up perfectly. We know we're looking toward the battlefield, and it does look a little bit hazy. Maybe we're actually seeing some battle smoke there. But I would suggest there are combat photos, just not the ones we think of, because even a two second exposure isn't going to show a line of troops marching by. You can look at the photos of the Grand Review in Washington in May of 1865 to see that when soldiers are moving, it's really hard to capture them, um, even, even at the walking pace. But here we have what is normally a boring looking photo, but when I've zoomed in like this, what we're seeing is people on a beach looking over toward the USS Ironsides, which it clearly is in the process of firing right there. You can see the smoke rising up and whatnot, and you can even see some monitor ships um, hanging out close to the water line over there. There's an even better one of actual um, combat here off Charleston Harbor as well. So you can see these monitors in the iron side, you see some battle smoke. So I think that's about as close as we're gonna get at 2nd Fredericksburg in May of 1863. You can also see some battle smoke rising as Union troops advance in that smoke. It's pretty cool, but um, not the type of combat images we might think of. Now, of course, we have lots of myths at the Battle of Gettysburg and whatnot, and there's a lot of photographic myths, okay? And here is one that uh, has, like, like most myths, shreds and, re and big doses of truth in there. So this is a soldier. He is uh, unidentified, and here he is laying. There's four photos of this soldier taken here below Devil's Den. The top of Devil's Den is up over that way, and here he is. And he's different than all the other dead soldiers at Gettysburg, um, and, and, in this, and mo in most of the Civil War, that he's not bloated. The Union, Union photographers gained access to this battlefield pretty early afterward, but even by then most of the bodies had become terribly disfigured, sadly disfigured, but not him. So maybe he survived a little bit longer, maybe his composition changed the idea of putrefaction a little bit for him, but either way, there were four pictures taken of him here before he was put onto a blanket and dragged up the hill 72 yards to make this very, very famous photograph. Uh, sometimes you can see the blanket they dragged him on. Um, I bet you most of you all have been there before. These rocks are still there. Up until a few years ago, that pool still filled with water until the rock broke apart. Little round top, barely visible in the background. Beautiful, famous photograph. And nobody knew it was really the same soldier uh, for 99 years or so, or 98 years. Um, William Fresnito tells the whole story in his various books. Now, there are six photos taken of this soldier, meaning that that is fully 6% of the photos of dead soldiers taken on battlefields. We know of exactly 97 photos of Civil War soldiers dead on battlefields, um, a little bit you know, macabre of a subject, but it's something we have to study and do very closely. So he is the most photographed corpse um, of the Civil War, not a myth. Now, people have ever since then tried to identify this soldier because you know, there's only about 70 people it could be. It's at Devil's Den. We know where he died. We know where he was dragged to. We know which units fought there. First Texas, 20th Georgia, maybe 17th Georgia, um, you know, maybe the 44th Alabama. And only so many of those people died, and only so many of those people, um, you know, didn't die in hospitals where they wouldn't have been left out there afterward. For a long time ago, our good battlefield guide friend, uh, Ed Guy, has been pushing a theory about this guy named Langley in the first Texas. Kind of looks like him. Okay, uh, you know, there's some things maybe the chin is off, and I'm not sure if it's quite him exactly. Uh, one thing I've learned over the years is people tend to look like themselves, okay? If you have to say, well, you know, he's got a straight mouth here, and he's got eyebrows different there, if you have to start to explain that stuff, it's probably not the same person. People tend to look like they actually do. More recently in Civil War times, somebody has taken a photo of a guy much younger and said, well, this is him when he's younger, and he's not in any of the units that Gary just mentioned, but on July 3rd, he might have been there, and maybe it's him. Oh, yeah, it's him. 
And this drives me crazy when people have some shred of evidence and then they call it truth and then they put it in a major magazine and say, it's true. Um, of course, I had to write, uh, write into the magazine on that one. But, um, you know, I don't know who the guy is. And this is another thing that drives me nuts. Well, if you don't know who it is, then it must be him. What are you talking about? Okay, because I can't cure cancer doesn't mean your cure is right. Okay, so this, this happens with great frequency in Civil War and history world. Um, so I thought I'd get into that one, but this is just a warm-up exercise for the most misidentified people in any Civil War photo, and that is the three Confederate prisoners at Gettysburg. And here I have up here a more famous inst in, uh, instance, but over the years people have been very certain. I know who that is. That's my ancestor. That's this person. And in this case, somebody came up with a theory, went to the Postal Service. The Postal Service said, you got it, without doing any research, issued a stamp on it and put it all over the internet. Um, and in the meantime, Time. I can't remember all the details, but two of these guys are supposed to be husband, uh, father and son. I mean, they just don't look that far apart in age. One was already in a hospital like elsewhere. I think one was killed or almost dying somewhere else. It's just absolutely impossible. Now, I think it would be great if we could identify these guys and the dead sharpshooter, but not to just ascribe some sort of a name to these people. I mean, talk about a myth. And the greatest Civil War photography myth that drives me the most nuts, and I'll blame Ken Burns for this, is that, oh, it's such a shame all of the Civil War negatives have been burned away in the nation's greenhouses, okay? This is absolutely false. And let me set it straight for you. We know which photos largely the Civil War photographers took. They issued catalogs, and you know what? Those glass plate negatives are still in the Library of Congress and the National Archives. They are accounted for. We know that Robert E. Lee in front of his house or behind his house and that U.S. Grant um, at Cold Harbor, those plates are still there. They didn't burn away in greenhouses. What may have burned away in greenhouses, and what you're seeing here is a uh, sort of a uh, uh, a, an art piece suggesting that, look, look, see, I'm going to make a greenhouse now out of all these Civil War negatives. Um, what, what may have happened is that, first of all, these are all portraits burning away in greenhouses, and second of all, these are either the failed portraits or the ones that people didn't pick up, so they sold the glass later, and then it burned away. So if I can save you on that, great. Oh man, I've given whole 45 minute talks just on this series. This is called The Harvest of Death. Um, there are several bodies in a photo at Gettysburg from two different directions that people have been looking for it for 30 years. And here's another example where I don't know where it is. And then people say, well, if you don't know where it is, one of the other theories must be right, which is absolutely insane. Um, these are union dead, so everybody really wants to find it. Because they're union dead, taken by northern photographers, we figure these are about the first photos taken at Gettysburg because they buried the union dead very quickly. Um, so we look at all these photos for them. A lot of people say, well, this is just one photo, but you can zoom in on these photos. And I can see some of the, some of the remains here, but I'll point toward a little cat box here and some sort of a cartridge box there. And you can see in another photo of the same thing that somebody has moved the little white box in the back. Okay, so that tells me, okay, there are two different versions of this photo. And then there are 50 other things you have to do. And then it all has to work out in order to find a location. Another thing that drives me crazy, of course, and this is, you know, might fly in the face of people in this room, but this idea that the Civil War in the West didn't matter, that the Civil War was won in the East, and everything that happened in the East was more important. And to an extent, in public perception, that was true. I mean, just look at this all within a few months. Mill Springs and Pea Ridge, Nashville Falls, Forts Henry and Donaldson Fall, and that's just the beginning of what's going on out West. Abraham Lincoln couldn't believe this. The Union troops in early 1862 captured 100,000 miles, square miles of territory in early 1862. And then Robert E. Lee kind of not loses one battle, and then it's as if none of that ever happened. Lincoln just couldn't believe it, and the people out west have been mad about that, and I say out west, I mean out here, um, you know, have been mad about it ever since then. People that fought at those battles said these battles were important, and people at those parks today say, hey, these battles are really important. Um, so this is unfortunately how it works. <laughs> okay, you've probably seen it before. The east consists of portions of three states, of Pennsylvania, Maryland, um, and Virginia, just parts, and maybe a little bit of what is now West Virginia. And somehow, if you go south and east from Petersburg, you're in the West. I just, it's just beautiful. Now, um, unfortunately for people that like Western battlefields, and I'm one of them, it's more like that. You know, there's the East, and then there's this other stuff, okay? And even worse, if you think the West has it bad, oh man, the Trans-Mississippi really has it bad. I mean, uh, it even took me 30 years to go and visit these battlefields just recently. So. You know, this, this idea that the, because the East is more popular uh, and the battlefields are really close together, have you ever taken a trip of the West of the Transmiss? Oh my God, it's really difficult to do all the sites. In the East, you could take a couple of weeks and visit the most major battlefields of the Civil War with a few exceptions and visit them all. Um, so it is an interesting situation, but this has nothing to do with how important what happened out here was. Um, 
It also drives me crazy that at a Battle of Fredericksburg, you have the Stone Wall, and obviously that's where all the fighting happened, and that's where the important fighting happened, and that's where everything was going on. Well, that's not the case at all. It seems like about half the casualties were on this side of the battlefield, and half the casualties were on the other side of the battlefield. And oh man, back to Gettysburg, where you know you get to Little Round Top, which you know was just an unassuming sort of rocky hill that looks really cool until July of 1863. And even after the battle, it was sort of the Union left. And then within 10 years, it was the key to the Union left. And then within 50 years, it was the most important of all Civil War features. All the armies on Earth could not batter it down. It was the most important thing in the world, and it is just crazy. Um, when you stand on Little Round Top, it is a great view. It's a great story. You've got the college professor. You've got these people from five different states fighting against Confederates at the edge of their rope in the farthest north place they practically ever were. Um, and it just doesn't add up. The idea that the Confederates capture a Little Round Top and somehow control the world or the Gettysburg battlefield or win the Civil War just doesn't add up. Um, the, everything that people say they can do with it, capture the Tawny Town Road sitting behind it, capture a bunch of Union artillery, which I guess the Yankees would just leave it up there with all the firing implements, and repel the Union soldiers who were already on the way. I have a whole book about this if anybody's interested. Um, you know, the idea that the cornfield in Antietam has to be the bloodiest place because I like to look at that. It's, it's in the east, and I like that. Um, when really, the much less sexier named Rose Woods at Gettysburg is obviously much bloodier than that. The idea that George McClellan had 30,000 soldiers in reserve at Antietam, right in this very area here, taken just a day after the Battle of Antietam, just isn't true. He had moved most of the Sixth Corps across the river already at that point. The Fifth Corps had already tried to make an attack. He didn't have these massive reserves, but it fits into the myth, right? Because McClellan is a coward. McClellan's afraid the enemy's going to come at him all the time, um, and therefore he must have had, you know, a third of his army in reserve. Now, could his reserves have turned the tide of battle? Absolutely. James Longstreet said it on two occasions in the battle, that 10,000 more troops could have meant the end of the army in Northern Virginia. But that's easy to say when you're not the big boss. And Longstreet knew that, because he, well, he was the big boss, he didn't take the long chances. And one last thing to leave you with on this front, if he does throw in 10,000 more troops and they do destroy the army of Northern Virginia, are the slaves freed? I'll just leave you with that. Um, in recent years, you've seen, you know, that the 620,000 people that died in the Civil War has been questioned, okay? And that was mainly from one study, and that's a statistician who took censuses from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, 18, that is, and determined, oh my God, it's 620,000, um, you know, soldiers. That's way too low. It's something more. And he did what I always call like an Adams County or Central Pennsylvania forecast, you know. It's between 650 and 900,000, you know. <laughs> it's just like with the coronavirus now. Sorry, I mean, you know, oh my God, we're going to get two to 70 inches by toilet paper. You know, and that's you know, how people are. I lived around here for a while, so I'm allowed to say that. Um, but he's using census data. It includes civilians, okay? Plus a range that big. What are we supposed to do with that, okay? So it includes people that died after the Civil War. It includes non-soldiers. So I've never changed my number. I don't know if that's a myth or not, but this is myth and mistakes. And just this idea that Gettysburg is, of course, the turning point of the Civil War. It is the biggest, largest, or bloodiest battle of the Civil War, with the most troops fighting in it at once. You do have, you know, near population centers, and you have this grand, mighty charge at the end. But, and I'm a Gettysburg fan, it pains me to say it, but I don't know how people call Gettysburg nearly as important as something like Vicksburg, which happens, of course, the same week, and literally does this. I mean, it's a cliche to say cut the Confederacy in two, but that's exactly what it does. Okay? The Southerners can no longer get any meaningful transportation from any of these states over to the other side. Why? Because the Union's got the blockade, they've got this. It changes things greatly. Suddenly the Southerners are now trying to get beef, slaves, and salt out of Florida, where there's hardly any railroads at all. With the Union controlling the coasts, it made it extraordinarily more difficult than that. Now, the idea that there's even one turning point in the Civil War drives me crazy. Maybe Fort Sumter's the biggest one, and then maybe Appomattox and Bennett Place would be some of the other big ones. So this drives guides crazy, oh yeah. So I open with this one. I don't know if you all have come to visit this one before, but what this is, this is the mini ball pregnancy, okay? So tell me what is more feasible to you that a single woman, okay, is in her house, and there she is, I think, I can't remember exactly where, but I think it might be near Vicksburg. That's where this bullet is in any case. And this bullet gets shot at a soldier, and it goes right through his testicles, through him, out his clothing, hits her clothing, gets through that clothing, and then into her ovaries. Um, with the, of course, appropriate matter still on it, and she became impregnated. Or, maybe she's not the first one to have sex out of wedlock in the 1860s. <laughs> I, just, I can't quite tell which one is more reasonable, but those are the two choices. Um, 
Following this up, a woman, uh, a, a, one of those Mythbusters, I think the show did it, where they actually, oh no, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine did it, actually. So they took, you know, they have this gel that approximates a human body, and they put clothes on it, and they tried to see if living matter, sperm in this case, could come out of something, <laughs> sorry, uh, and then go through the clothing, and then through someone else's clothing, and then into the body, and, and, and do that. They determined it was impossible at that point, so I'm sorry to say, this might not be true. <laughs> I mean, really. And then, of course, you have something that must have happened. Bullets that met in midair. I remember when I was younger, I saw these in the books. Oh my god, the rarest of the rare. They say, you need a Confederate bullet. They met in midair, okay? Um, which, I, I'm sure it did happen. It just had to. I mean, in a place like Gettysburg, somebody did a calculation that 150 pounds of iron or lead was used to kill each person. I mean, that is just an extraordinarily large amount of metal for how small these things are. The one guy, I remember, went to Gettysburg in the 1880s or 1890s, maybe early 1900s, and he went back home and showed his friend, I bought it, the rarest of the rare. He produced this, these bullets that it meant midair. And then his friend said, hold on, wait. And he went back and pulled one out too. And he's like, I got one too. And they looked very similar. And the guy said, where'd you get that? Where'd you get that? They questioned. They found they bought it at the same shop in Gettysburg. And they knew something was up. They went up there together, broke into the guy's back room, and found that he had a mechanism where he could shoot two rifles by a timing device at the same time and make these things. They roughed him up and knocked over his equipment and walked out of there, which is just great. Um, and then, of course, you've got my favorite Gettysburg Devil's Den story here. It's not about these particular guys here, but it's just a story that a guy told about people doing what was called piecing up, okay, where a man who got his arms blown off during the battle happened to find another man who got his legs blown off during the battle, and the man with no legs and two arms got on the back of the guy with two legs and no arms, and they went to get water together. Come on! Um, so we have stories like this. We used to call them old guide stories. I'll just flash that up for no particular reason. Um, and man, you know, we know what Jefferson Davis was wearing when he was captured in Irvinville, Georgia on May 10th, 1865. We know what he was wearing. I've seen it before. I've been this close from it, okay? It's very well provenanced. It's in the Museum of the Confederacy. There he is wearing it over there. But man, when you want to hit a vanquished enemy, uh, there is nothing quite like making them seem a little bit less manly. Okay, so maybe you see him here kind of cowering before some Union soldiers. Oh man, let's put some petticoats on this guy. Uh, let's give him a knife, although he's going to a gunfight. But let's put a shawl on him as well. And the press was just brutal. It's never ending. Here he is. Now he's running away. Now he's in a full-on ball gown. Okay, not even just the petticoats here. And then you've got him running away this way. And now they're like laughing at him. It's even worse. This is just the antithesis of a good 19th century capture, especially for a dignified presidency. Here he says, oh my god, his dress is getting caught on the fence. Um, now they're lifting a shawl, so he's actually hiding his face here. Um, and then they write a song about it. I mean, if, if, if you think people are different back then than today, I mean, this is exactly what kids call auto-tuning and whatnot. They're, they're putting it on social media here. There's now a song about it. And look at him, you know, laying on the ground with the uh, base of his hoop skirt there. And then, oh my god, let's give him a red dress and have him running in that red dress. And then I, I feel kind of bad uh, for him because they didn't do this stuff to Abraham Lincoln. Oh, wait. I think they did. So here's Abraham Lincoln sneaking into Washington. Yeah, Lincoln has enemies too, and especially his southern enemies. Look at him, this new supposed hick president-elect, slinking his way into Washington, peeking through a thing. Oh, look at him, he's like a scarecrow running into town trying to slip in. Oh, let's put him in bed clothes. This is great. He's even got like a little nightcap on, but you still gotta, you really wanna make him less manly. So the closest they came for him that I could tell was a kilt. You know, he's either, he's gotta have him wearing something feminine one way or another. And, you know, Lincoln has suffered his sorts of things, especially in the modern era, because, you know, you see a guy with a top hat anywhere in there, and there he is. Oh, God, you know what? He looks tall to me. He's got a, somewhat of a beard. That's, a, that's Lincoln, okay? And this is just crazy, because now, even in the South, even in Fort Sumter, in Confederate held Fort Sumter, where you have General Wade Hampton there, um, you know, they're all Lincoln, because if you're wearing a top hat, it just has to be like it. I'm not so sure about this guy. He's got the shorter hat. And then, you know, if you're even if you're standing in front of a light post that looks like you're wearing a tall hat, that's Lincoln, too. Um, and of course, at the Gettysburg Address, you've got Lincolns everywhere except where there's actually Lincoln. So plenty of top hats. And of course, you know, Teddy Roosevelt is absolutely Lincoln. And I'm not kidding, I see things for sale on eBay, pictures that were taken in 1868 and 1874, years after Lincoln was 
you know, killed, and there he is, Abraham Lincoln, because everyone wants to find the Lincoln photo. And some of the harshest litigation in this subject I've ever heard of is people that are certain they have that Abraham Lincoln photo because it'll be worth millions if they have a new original Lincoln photo. And it's just, it's just, just crazy. And it goes for hats for other people too. This is a photo taken on what is now Georgia Tech campus. And this kid there is wearing a hardy hat. Oh my God, he must be in the Iron Brigade because no one ever wore a hardy hat except in the Iron Brigade. By the way, one of my favorite photo details of the whole Civil War. Look at these kids, okay? These are Civil War soldiers in a Western regiment that just took Atlanta. Pretty cool. Um, and in this same photo, I'll zoom in, but there's another guy with a hardy hat. And if you zoom in, you can see it says 150 on it. He's in the 150th New York. He's some of those, one of those units that went west um, during the middle of the Civil War or so. And this leads to something else. So he's got the hardy hat, but when you zoom in even more on that guy uh, who's standing right there, you see, oh my God, he's actually barefoot. He's a Union soldier. Wait, I thought all the Confederates were barefoot. I didn't think there was a single shoe in the whole Confederacy. In fact, isn't that why the Battle of Gettysburg started? It was because there was a rumored thing of shoes and all the Confederates were barefoot. You see how this stuff all works? So, so it all works together. One myth begets another, right? So Grant is a butcher, therefore he you know, uh, you know, beat Lee just in that one way, and therefore he's always smoking and he's drunk, and that's how you can be a butcher, because you don't care anymore. These myths really work together. And by the way, I'm sorry to leave this up there, because that guy's got a creepy foot going on there. Like maybe he's got his shoe off because there's some sort of a big swelling going on there, but you know, the shoes weren't very good back then, so I'll give him a pass there, but I'll leave it up there for an extra minute just to get you to contemplate it there. Um, and another massive myth of the Civil War is that there are a lot of amputations in the Civil War. They have an actual count that you see here at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, and I, which is a great facility to visit, and I know they cover some great uh, medical things here as well. There's a lot of really cool facilities um, in this general area. And what I like about this is the percentage of uh, uh, death that you might be able to have. So you know that the farther away you are from your core, the better chance you have of living. Toe or a finger, 90% chance of survival. Ankle or wrist, okay, it goes down a little bit. You know, knee, ooh, 30, 40% chance of living. And then if you get to where you're gonna have the full on at the hip amputation, you might only have a 10 or a 20% chance of living. But the myth here is not your chance of living. Your myth here is that most of these things were done gone with the wind and dances with wolves style. Um, and in fact, with glory as well. So on through bones and whatnot, and when we know that 90% of amputations were done with painkillers, with morphine, with ether, or other painkillers, okay, we know this, North and South had this technology, and when they went to do them, surgeons, you know, they might not have been like today's surgeons, but they had careful materials that were made specifically to cut the muscle around in the skin first, to prepare the bone, so that the only thing they're sawing is the bone itself, not this blood spurt thing. A lot of the work is done before um, the sawing actually begins. And oh man, I, I have fun with this on social media because I often ask people, what would you rather have? You know, a thousand guys with smooth bore muskets or 1,500 guys with just cannons or this people with, with rifle muskets or one guy with a Henry repeating rifle? And they all, there's always some people who say, oh, give me the one Henry. I can take on the entire army of Northern Virginia if you give me one repeater. So give me a sec so I can explain what these things are because this drives me nuts, okay? The North and South used a lot of the same guns. Some were smooth bores, they fired round bullets, and some were rifled. They fired conical bullets that spun as they left the barrel. I think you all know that, okay? But all of these guns were loaded toward the top, which meant you had to stand up to fire them, to load them, and it took you longer, okay? Then they figured out how to load at the back, the breech loaders, okay? Breech loaders are not the same things as repeaters. A breech loader allows you to load much more easily and more quickly because you're not going in through the top. And then, they came up with a thing where repeaters where you can not only load it back here, but it can fire more than one shot at a time, you know, in a row before reloading. The Spencer might do seven or eight, the Henry might do 15 or 21 or something like that, depending on the year, okay? So there are a lot of different kinds of guns, but because these things exist doesn't mean that all of Buford's guys at Gettysburg have these repeaters, or that this guy, John T. Wilder, that his lightning brigade has Henry's all over the place and they always won. It's really self-fulfilling because when they didn't win, they were like, oh, but they did really well, okay? So you've got this Henry repeating rifle that is increasingly, by the end of the war, making a real difference in the war, but it's not invincible any more than Robert E. Lee or U.S. Grant um, or anything else is invincible. 
One thing I want to say about that is that, you know, the Southerners didn't have a whole lot of repeating rifles or Gatling guns um, during the Civil War. And that is because this thing that you hear about the North being more industrial and the South being more agricultural is the least myth thing in the whole Civil War. This is as real as it gets. Uh, the North always had more of what they needed. The South was always hurting for fuses and ammunition and ships and everything like that. And for every Southern factory worker, the North had an entire factory, okay? Wrap your head around that, and you could see how difficult it was for the North to really fight against the South. And what I'm trying to do today, more than anything, is, is, is to hope that you can hope to separate myth, you know, fact from fiction, and know what is myth, okay? Because there are a lot of very true things about the Civil War, of course, as well. Lincoln didn't finish writing the Gettysburg Address on the train on the back of an envelope on the way up. We have the originals. We have good accounts of when and where he finished writing it. We know what he wrote it on. Um, and in Cold Harbor, not every person that fought there um, d died, and not every person that died there was killed in the second charge at Cold Harbor, and not every person that did die pinned their name on the back of their uniform. It's this thing, Cold Harbor is a great battlefield. There are great entrenchments there and earthworks, but most of what everybody knows about it is myth. Some people did put their names on the back of their uniforms. Some people did die in that one charge, but it was a two-week fight. Two weeks they were fighting at Cold Harbor. Okay? And the most of the fighting was not done, you know, where people think it was actually done. So sometimes when you get into battles, Gettysburg, Cold Harbor, they suffer from mini myth as well. Um, and at Cold Harbor here too, well, I was just showing you this picture, excuse me. Oh man. So you also have this thing at Gettysburg, and I think some guides are still telling this story. Um, and in case you don't know, let me say, for the equestrian statues, the horse statues at Gettysburg, and only um, the horse statues, but also at other places, supposedly if that equestrian statue has four hoofs on the ground, that soldier was not killed or wounded during the battle. If they have one hoof up, they were wounded during that battle. If they have two hoofs up, they were killed during the battle. Of course, four hoofs up, we all know, is Robert E. Lee. So, um, <laughs> This is just crazy, okay? So first of all, and Tim's done this study himself before, I learned most of this from him. First of all, the sculptors and the sculptor makers were told about this thing, and they were like, oh, that sounds really interesting. Like, they didn't know anything about this. Plus, if you go around the world, whether it be Rome or D.C., and by the way, in places like D.C., when there's equestrian monuments, what does that mean? Where were they killed or not killed or not wounded or not killed? Uh, I don't understand. Um, it doesn't even work at Gettysburg. It works about the normal percentage of times at most places. So this is a complete myth, this idea, um, that the horse hoofs have anything to do with whether someone was killed or wounded. At Gettysburg, it used to work until the 90s just by chance, and it was just that. It was complete coincidence. Okay, I saved these for midway in because this is what some, some people are going to hate me about, but um, I don't know why secession is controversial. The South went to great lengths to say exactly why they were seceding. Now, I'm not talking about fighting here, I'm talking about seceding. They wrote ordinances of secession, they sent commissioners, at least the initial states that were going to get more states there, and tried to convince the other states, and all those things were in writing, and you can read them all. They said why they were seceding, they were seceding so that they could maintain slavery. They told us that. I don't know why it's controversial, okay? now. That's not exactly why the Civil War started. You could say the Civil War starts over federal property at Fort Sumter, right? That really, the, the way, reason it, the shooting starts doesn't have a whole lot to do with slavery. It's because the Union soldiers are inside what they considered federal property and the South considered Southern property. Now, what makes me much more worked up, though, than this is the idea that suddenly, because the South seceded because of slavery, that that's why everybody fought. I don't know why people make that leap. And if we could just do this one thing, if we could stop conflating why the South seceded from why soldiers fought, everything would be a lot easier because you rightly have people saying, my grandfather didn't own slaves and you're saying he fought for slavery. The answer is, no, I don't know why he fought exactly. He didn't necessarily fight for or against slavery. He might have had nothing to do with all that. So the North and South is not homogenous. I do know in terms of perception that people in the South looked to the North and saw greedy capitalists that didn't care about family or way of life, and the people in the North looked South and saw cruel, lazy race of people that didn't care about education. The Civil War, in my opinion, is a big war of perception. In fact, the South really wasn't being attacked on slave fronts, but they perceived Abraham Lincoln as hostile to slavery, and that's when they started seceding. Now, when you really look at the South here, uh, the darker areas are the higher concentrations of slavery. You can see how somebody in northern or southern Missouri might feel differently than someone that lives along the river. You can see how somebody in northwest Arkansas is going to feel different than somebody who lives along coastal Virginia or coastal North, 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 Carol South, North or South Carolina. So 
what I want to get at here is that the South is not homogenous. You know, everybody in the North is not somehow good and somehow cares about African Americans. That is not the case at all. Everyone North and South, by our standards today, are racist. This is a nation of racists if we apply our current uh, opinion of things. Even Abraham Lincoln, William Lloyd Garrison, you know, you know, whoever you could think of that are the most pro-abolition people, you know, would be racist by our own terminology or by our own consideration today. And people in the South, while you didn't have him speaking out a whole lot against, you know, slavery, you know, that, that was not really happening in the South, you really don't have a homogenous view of the South, even though we like to paint it that way. So when you look at people, North, South, Naval, Army, Black, White, I mean, I see a whole lot of different motivations. And I could pick any subject of today. And man, if I wanted to get controversial, I'll get into these, but I won't. But just think of your own thoughts on immigration or on abortion or on gun control. And think of the people you know that feel strongly about either side of that issue or some somewhere in the middle. And can you ascribe one thing of why they feel that way? Of course not. You can't take everybody for or against anything today and say that it's just because of one thing, that it's just because of my Second Amendment rights, or it's just because I feel this way about life or about, uh, you know, I, don't, I really don't want to get into this. But somehow when it comes to the Civil War, we want to ascribe one reason for things, and I really don't understand it, okay? It's a family museum, so I put it in here this way. And here it is, okay? Because most of y'all have seen this movie. This is from the Titanic movie, right? This is Rose when she's being drawn on April 12th. Um, you know, right there, and here you have Bill Paxton, the late Bill Paxton, saying, you know, you see the date on that right there, and he points to it and says, that's April 12th. I think it was the 14th, I can't read from here. <laughs> yeah, wrong century, I'm better on the older one. Um, you know, it's April 14th. That means she's wearing a necklace the night Titanic sank, and therefore, it must be in that safe. What, what kind of work is that? Okay, like there's no other option? Like she couldn't have kept it with her? Like she couldn't have given it to somebody else? As if it had to go down with the ship. So these millions of dollars in this fictitious scenario, tens of millions I imagine, were spent trying to find something that was never there because of that little historical leap that people often make to this day. So I thought it was a good example. When in fact, and if you were to look at the soldiers who fought in the Civil War, you would see that they fought for a lot of different reasons. You don't just have the slave owner fighting for slavery. You don't just have the northern black guy fighting to free the slaves, okay? You have every sort of a reason, uh, and this could be a job, this could be for honor, this could be for a sense of adventure. You have any number of reasons why people are fighting, and if we could just do this one thing, I'll be really, no, if 1% of the people could do this one thing, I'd be immensely happy. One of the hardest things to describe about why people fought in the Civil War, beside honor, oh my God, that is the most difficult 19th century concept for me to get behind, is this idea of union. Okay? And we've really lost this idea of how essential this was to people back then who were imbued with a revolutionary idea of the democratic republic. It, as Ben Franklin said, this is a republic if you can keep it. Okay? We, we might struggle with this today, right? As you see, maybe a lack of emphasis on history um, in this country. I won't just say in schools. Um, I'll say in this country, and that goes from top to bottom. I mean, as a parent, do you feel you need to take a kid to a battlefield or historic site or Disney World first? Okay? Um, but this idea of union really offended you know, union people in the North, that, that the union would not be preserved. And a lot of Southerners were against secession for that reason. So I would encourage you to look into this idea of union. Gary Gallagher does a really good job of it. And by the way, I know you can't retain, <laughs> nor would you want to, most of what I'm saying. But at the American Battlefield Trust, we have a four-minute video on union by Gary Gallagher. We have a four-minute video on myth from me. And you can get a summary of this talk there. We have, we have videos for probably most of what you want to see. And of course, it is openly called a myth now, the myth of the lost cause, of course. And you know, I don't blame anybody for getting into a fight and thinking, you know what, the reason I fought might not be so popular anymore. I'm going to, you know, come up with a way where I can feel decent about what we did. And of course, that was to elevate Robert E. Lee by saying that the war produced the greatest, you know, one of the greatest of all American figures, um, and that that great figure was only beat by a drunken butcher who just threw superior resources at us, um, and then it went after other people to really try to work on and later say, this, the Civil War was not really about slavery. It was fought because you were down here. It was fought for our honor. Um, I would encourage you all to look into it and see what they said during the 1860s. I don't know anybody who would prefer, if you're looking at your own life, uh, and you had kept a journal from 1977, and I'm trying to find out where I went to dinner in 1977. I don't know who anybody who would go to the you know, 2004 journal to find out where I went to dinner in 1977. I'd look at the journal from 1977, which is exactly what you should do for this sort of stuff. Why did people say they were fighting the Civil War? Why did they secede? And I think you'll understand their motivations a little bit better. 
The Lost Cause did this, Robert E. Lee above all, of course, which didn't emerge till after his death. And oh man, it's this guy's fault, James Longstreet. You know what, he has northern friends. He's friends with Ulysses S. Grant. Oh my God, that former president. Reconstruction, what a failure. You know what, by the way, he's a drunken butcher and anti-Semite and whatnot. But nonetheless, at the time of his death, U.S. Grant was one of the most popular people in the whole world. I thought it was the best part of the Chernow book where they described the funeral and you could get an idea. And you have Frederick Douglass, you know, if, if he wasn't kind to African Americans, I wonder why all the African Americans love Grant. I wonder why he has Jews and Southerners as part of his pallbearers. He's a really interesting figure. Um, early on in the war, people quickly figured uh, that one southern soldier was not worth 10 Yankee hirelings. Uh, it did not, shall I say, exceed 10 Yankee hirelings. Uh, the South found that out pretty quick. Uh, and, you know, you have all these mistakes made during the Civil War that I'm just going to gla glaze over real quick. And that is, you know, this is Joe Hooker saying the Army of Northern Virginia was our prize and they must ingloriously fly or meet certain destruction. This is right before Chancellorsville. How'd that go for you, Joe Hooker? Um, <laughs> you know, you've got, uh, you know, here at second, after Second Manassas, Robert E. Lee saying, oh, yes, they will flock to us if we march through Maryland. Our army will go from 40,000 to 60,000 if only we can march through Maryland. Oh, my God, Lee makes a mistake. And marches through the wrong part of Maryland to secure a lot of lot more people for his cause. He went through a pro-union part of Maryland, not further to the east where he might have received more. And you have people in the Civil War making all sorts of defensive mistakes, such as here at Harpers Ferry, incredibly shown the old bridge in 1859, this is right after John Brown was there, um, of people saying, well, we'll put some troops up there. There's no way the Confederates can attack up Maryland Heights. Well, they did just that, um, ask some New York soldiers. Um, Joseph E. Johnston saying that, you know, there is no way William Tecumseh Sherman can march through the Carolinas. You know those swamps, that's going to take a year. Well, he did it in six weeks. Um, you have uh, Union soldiers at Cedar Creek saying, oh, I'm not worried about the Confederates. The mountain's in their way. They can't possibly hug that close between the mountain and the creek in order to fall upon our flank. Well, that didn't go so well for the Union. U.S. Grant, you can't possibly build a pontoon bridge across a 2,000-foot-wide river, the James River. And, of course, he did just that uh, with the help of a bunch of boats keeping it in place. And incredibly, these are some of the troops marching over toward Petersburg on that very pontoon. Um, you know, regularly people saying, no, oh, we're protected by the wilderness. Ask O.O. Howard. They're not going to get through the wilderness and fall upon my flag. Nobody can march through that. And yet, how many times did the Confederates do it during the Civil War? Um, you know, hey, General Sherman, attack Missionary Ridge. Yep, I got it. I'll be there. And he, of course, attacks the wrong hill called Billy Goat Hill. Um, you know, and of course, then when you get into popular media, there's no difference at all uh, when filmmakers are not historians. Um, and animators are not historians, and you have Ken Burns saying this, within a half an hour I could convert Little Round Top into a Gibraltar that I could hold against ten times the, men, the number of men I have. The original quote said Round Top, or it. I could convert it, meaning Round Top. That's what he was talking about, big Round Top. Okay? Ken Burns didn't know there's a difference between the two necessarily, adds the word little, changes the whole meaning of what William Calvin Oates was saying in terms of defending a hill. And this is how myth starts. I run into all these books now where people use that quote because Ken Burns used it. Because people believe in the greenhouses because Ken Burns used it. Because Joshua Chamberlain was the only one to make a textbook maneuver because Ken Burns says it. So I love Ken Burns and all. And you know, this does bring you to a thing though. I love a lot of Civil War movies, but they are full of errors. And this is why you have to be skeptical of these things. It's your job to be that. You can enjoy it. I love the movie Armageddon. I love Cold Mountain. I, I love all these Civil War and history movies. I guess Armageddon doesn't fit into that one. Um, but uh, <laughs> I do love that movie, though. I love Titanic, too. Um, just know that they're full of errors. Uh, you know, in the Glory movie, who is this Mulcahy guy? Is he like the Buster Kill Rain, you know, sort of, of the Glory movie? The Glory's my favorite history movie, too. I just love it. But when you're a Glory person, if you're a 54th Massachusetts enthusiast, if you're somebody who knows Charleston Harbor, you know how many mistakes are in this. Which direction did they even attack? Where are they attacking? Who's in charge, okay? And of course that, you know, novels are novels, okay? We shouldn't expect them to be perfectly accurate. I love this book, okay? But it is based, it is a novel, and the Gettysburg movie is based on it. And then we take it as truth, and we think that there were six regiments at Gettysburg, and that Joshua Chamberlain commanded them all, um, and that there were five Confederate generals and a British observer there, and everybody had a lot of time to hang out and talk during battle. These things do a lot of good, but you should know when you're reading a novel and when you're not. This goes, of course, for, uh, you know, the Lincoln movie and Ride with the Devil and whatnot. I mean, to make a movie, Movie, you need to do things like this. You need to have Mary Lincoln explaining to Abe Lincoln how long they've been in office. When we came here three years ago, like as if a spouse would ever say that to their husband during a presidency. But you need to do this for an audience, and we should be accepting of it. We should just know what's real. 
So here's a photo I took of the Parthenon uh, many years ago. And I remember when I took this photo. It was in 1989, and the sun was shining in the morning. And I thought, wow, that sun's going to end up on my camera. Little did I know that about five years later, suddenly that would no longer be sun in my camera, but it would be a ghost. Oh, man, these would be orbs suddenly. These photos I've been taking my whole life with sun or water on there became light rods or orbs or some other just complete garbage. It just drives me crazy. Crazy. Um, and the ghost thing has died down happily because, you know, the ghost people, they find ghosts wherever they are, but happily they're maybe not quite as popular. And I have no problem with people believing in ghosts. It's great. But since Tim and I wrote a Devil's Den book, we've been at ground zero on this for decades now. And, um, you know, the one thing you've got to know about them is that the ghost stories, at least that they tell in books, they are absolutely made up by people to make money. So I thought I would just say that. But, um, you know, you've got all sorts of different ways of getting at this, uh, you know, and I guess I would just say that here's a photo of me and Tim and Wayne Moss. <laughs> Leave that up there for a second. Oh, Wayne, Wayne's running away. Uh, 1996. And you know what? This photo, I didn't think anything was going on, but you know, there's a little something up there. Oh my God. Wait, when I took this photo, it was in a photo album still, and that's my finger showing up. But maybe years from now, somebody will say, oh, no, 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 he just took a picture of this screen, Wayne. We'll have to tackle him before this is over. Um, you know, so is this all it takes, you know, to convince somebody that something weird's going on? Oh, my God, somebody was watching over us that day. Um, and speaking of this, you know, it really helps when you're older and you can tell a story because nobody else is t there to argue with you anymore. And as the Civil War people started aging, um, much like the people in the World War II generation now, there weren't that many left as you got to the 30s and then into the 40s. And then the game was on, right? So that when John Salling died in 1959, March of 1959, he was the last, he, he wasn't the last surviving Civil War soldier. It made Walter Williams the last surviving Civil War soldier. Okay, Walter Williams was something like 106 years old. Um, his name was Walter, I believe, G. Williams at this time. And he went on and he died, okay? When he died, they said the last Civil War veteran is gone. And a newspaper reporter sort of said, you know, this doesn't make sense. I can't tell this guy was really in the Civil War. And the state, his state was Mississippi, said, no, no, it's right. It, it was him. That's definitely it. Federal government said, we agree. We don't have any records, but we agree. And there was a complete lack of records. In fact, you can look at the census records and you can find him. Um, before he changed his middle initial, and you can find him in the 1860 census um, as a uh, five-year-old, uh, and then you can find him in the 1870 census at 15, 80, 25. In 1910, he was still 55 years old, and he didn't check the box as a U.S. as a Confederate veteran at that time. Not until 1932, when Texas unveiled pensions, did he suddenly become a veteran and change his initial at that point, okay? Um, and you've got him dead to rights. There's no reason to lie on your census at the time. Oh, oh wait, there's going to be a war, and just in case I live really long and they give pensions to me later, let me go ahead and lie about my household now, um, and, and then for the next 60 years before I stop lying about it. So he's done. That makes John Salad the last surviving Civil War veteran, because he died earlier that year. Oh, wait. Um, he was also found to be six years old um, in 1860. So we got to move on to the next. Uh, in 1957, died William Lundy. Okay, so Lundy was the last surviving guy. Oh, sorry. Uh, he was not even in the right state. In fact, for this guy, nobody with his name even existed in the right time between the Mississippi River and the Rio Grande. It wasn't even close. So he is no longer the last surviving veteran. And then there's another guy I forget, and then there are eight more. Eight more soldiers who all totally falsified their documents, none of whom said that they were veterans, none of whom checked the box, and none of whom claimed their correct age until the 1920s or 1930s, um, and it went on and on from there. This doesn't stop Frank Dalton from saying, hey, I was Jesse James, and it doesn't stop uh, another guy from saying, I'm John Wilkes Booth, and it didn't stop another guy in 1971, Mac McGee. Some of you might remember this. He said, I dug, I'm 134, and I dug trenches for the, for the Confederate Army as a slave, and then I escaped, and I dug them for the Union Army. People looked it up, and there was a, maybe, apparently a Mac McGee, okay? What they didn't find until after he died was that Mac McGee died in 1890, but he left behind a son named Sylvester in 1880. So there was a very old guy, about 112, who was there, but he wasn't 134, and he wasn't in the Civil War, which makes... Uh, Pleasant Crump, the oldest last-to-die Confederate veteran, and this was uh, um, in 1951, and the official last surviving Confederate Union veteran or veteran of any side is, of course, Albert Wilson, who died at 108, not 109, um, in 1956. 
And a lot of the work I just was mentioning was done by a guy named Bill Marvel, William Marvel, who has a great article in an old Civil War Times, and I, I urge you to check it out because that was just scratching the surface on this story. And what this does is remind me of a story I read once, and some of us know, knew him, uh, Greg Coco, when he was still alive, and he told a story in one of his books um, about a guy from Ohio, Wayne's home state. And he used to tell people that his leg was, you know, shot off at the Battle of Gettysburg. And he told them about how he was cured of that. And he's walking down an Ohio highway, stumping it, as he said, with his, you know, uh, stump of a leg there with the peg. And he walked up to a house, and the woman said, oh, where'd you lose that leg? And he said, oh, at the Battle of Gettysburg. She's like, let me get my husband. And she gets the husband, and he says, oh, hey, partner, where, uh, where'd, you, where'd you fight with your regiment at Gettysburg? He's like, oh, in the cemetery. He's like, oh, let me get my son, Bill. My son, Bill, fought in the cemetery. And the guy's probably like, oh, no. So Bill shows up and says, oh, what kind of a stone did you fight behind? Oh, I was fighting behind a nice Scottish stone. It was ordained, ornamented like this. Oh, my brother Bill fought behind a stone. I think it's just like that one. And the brother Bill comes out and says, I was, I was behind that stone, and I was there alone. And he's like, but just in case, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. What unit did you fight with? He's like, my regiment was Company A, 35th Ohio. And he's like, oh, Andy, my little brother, fought in the 35th. Let me go get him. And Andy shows up and says, I've never seen you before in my life in the 35th. And by the way, we were never within 200 miles of Gettysburg. We fought in the West. And he said, no, I didn't say 35th. I said 25th Ohio. He's like, lucky for you, my little brother Hiram fought in the 25th. <laughs> Hiram comes out, says, you're a bald-faced liar. And they dragged him out to the road, pitched him over the fence, and threw him into the road, likeless or not. And the guy said, the moral of the story is, They've got this war stuff down to such a fine business now that you need to just say that maybe you just got drunk and walked in front of a locomotive and that's how you lost your leg. Uh, But, you know, in going through all of this, all in one sentence, uh, you know, you have these guys dying off, uh, especially in the 1940s, 1950s, and they all gathered together famously at Gettysburg in 1938. You can see some of them up the Peace Light Memorial up in the distance. I always like to point out this... uh, uh, you know, movie camera. Wow, Civil War soldier seeing a movie camera, color movie cameras even. And at this event, there were tanks, there were planes flying overhead. Oh my God, Civil War soldiers were there for these things that we're now familiar with. And I'll bet you, I would be willing to bet that somebody in this room probably met a Civil War veteran. It's certainly possible. I have met at least 200 people and shook, and shook their hands um, who have met, I probably wouldn't now, but um, <laughs> who have met Civil War soldiers. It wasn't that long ago. I've now been to one-fifth of the Battle of Gettysburg anniversary. By the time I die, who knows, maybe I'll have been to one-third of them. It wasn't that long ago, and this is my job at the Trust, of course, is to maybe try to make that past seem not so long ago, maybe make those people not seem so inaccessible so that we can engage in history um, you know, in, a, in a wholesome manner, in a way that's as free from prejudice as possible, of course. And one of the ways I like to do it is to say that we're just like them. And I've said this a few times already, and I like this. Here's a you know, photo of the Dunker Church. There's dead bodies everywhere. What do they do? They put, a sneak, they put a cool caption on it. This battery has been completely silenced with an exclamation point. It's not like, unlike Instagram, what we would do today, okay? And they had photos back then. Ooh, that's a dog on a limber. That's going to sell. And let me be like this dog here. I'm going to put that on social media, okay? They were a lot like us. And in fact, the way that they could use their photos was similar to the way that we did it. Now I'm going to close with what I think is one of the biggest myths of the entire Civil War, and I hear it all the time working where I work, um, and where I work, if you're not familiar with us, we save battlefields from the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, and the War of 1812, and we hear it all the time. Surely somebody has preserved all these battlefields already, and it's just not the case. The federal government did it in the 1890s, private groups did it before then, the government stayed tepidly in the business until the 1930s and 40s, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam didn't do anything to keep the federal government in that business, public interest had waned peaked again a little bit during the Civil War centennial, but the government got out of the land preservation business long ago, and that is why the American Battlefield Trust exists. We leverage government matching funds and our members' money to save battlefields, including the real farm at Antietam, the epicenter of Antietam, the east woods at Antietam, part of the north woods at Antietam. And when you look at our work over time, here is the Glendale Battlefield in 1987. If you have really good eyes, you might be able to see the two acres that were preserved there in 1987. Here it is two years ago. And even since then, we've secured all this land, much of this land, this battlefield is almost complete. Look at the Perryville battlefield. Everything in blue is what the trust has um, preserved, along with our partners. We have great partners in these places. Since uh, 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 this map was made, we have preserved that whole spot in yellow. And then we just this week uh, closed down this property here uh, to fill in the last bit. And really all we have is this piece of land and this one. And those of you in the audience that are members might get something in the mail about one of those before too long. Uh, trust members know we like to send a lot of mail and emails. Here's the battlefield of Brandy Station where zero acres were preserved in the late 1980s. 
And this is it now. I mean, it's a cavalry battle, so it was very sprawling. We've saved more land here than anywhere else, more than 2,000 acres, um, including Fleetwood Hill and some additional lands that aren't marked here. Maybe someday we can connect these so you can have one eight-mile walking trail there. It'll be just great. Um, and one last one here, the battlefield of Manassas, uh, where for a long time the park only had about 40 acres at Malvern Hill. Here it was three years ago. Okay, so you can see slowly, sometimes an acre at a time, um, as at Gettysburg and other places near here, we have preserved. We're able to slowly piece these battlefields back together, so I really hope you might get involved. Uh, we have saved 50, 52,000 acres of battlefield land um, so far, and I really appreciate you coming out during this weird time in our world, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.